So can I uh, welcome you uh, tonight um, to our, um, our speaker meeting. Uh, I'll hand over to um, Sam shortly, but uh, before we do, I just want to take the opportunity of saying uh, David and James and myself met up this afternoon um, to look at the speaker meeting programme, would you believe it, for 22-23. Um, we've got to keep looking ahead. Um, and um, we're, um, we're, we're looking for uh, speakers. Now, uh, David's about to send out to you an email. Uh, every member uh, will get a, a, a contact asking you, um, first of all, uh, to let us know your wishes uh, regarding venues. We, um, we moved to Zoom meetings uh, in the uh, pandemic and... Um, over the couple of years, we've had some very good uh, attendances. In fact, uh, we've had more on Zoom for some meetings than we've had at um, physical face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and so uh, we've, um, we're quite uh, into Zoom meetings. They don't cost us anything because we we bought the software two years ago. Um, we don't have to hire a room. It doesn't matter what the weather's doing outside. Uh, and uh, we can all gather together uh, safely in dark nights. You don't have to make your way through the streets of Lancaster. But people have said they miss those speaker meetings. And so we're asking you the question. Um, do you want to go back to speaker meetings? Do you want to continue with Zoom? Would you prefer a mix where we did Zoom meetings perhaps in the winter and physical face-to-face -face meetings in the summer? Um, so this will be up to you. We'll, we'll uh, take note of what you say. We're also asking if you have any favorite speakers that you've heard uh, in other places, and you think that uh, our members would be interested in hearing them, then we'd, we're asking for your suggestions on those. So that will be coming to you in the next few days. Uh, and so, uh, oh, the other point I wanted to make, uh, at the moment, we've got two strategy groups meeting. Uh, and these are looking, um, one, at the uh, traffic issues for the Lancaster area. Um, we weren't overexcited at what the County Council put forward and its suggestions, particularly for the gyratory, which, as we all know, in summer tends not to gyrate, um, in particularly because they didn't, appear to take into account um, the Loon Industrial Estate, which requires heavy goods vehicles to come through the city centre and make their way back out again. Uh, there's no account been taken of those. Uh, when you look at the plan, the proposals uh, are suggesting two-way private car driving on the western half of the uh, gyratory. So what on earth are they going to do with HGVs? Um, I honestly don't know. <clears throat> and that's scheduled to happen in 2024, and that will come quicker uh, than you expect. The other group is looking at tourism. And the pandemic badly affected tourism throughout the country uh, and the Lancaster area uh, especially. There are some figures on the um, Lancaster tourism uh, website showing the, uh, the drop in tourist income. So we're looking to see, have a review of what our tourist offer is and see if we can um, recommend some quick fixes um, 
not expensive, dramatic changes to the environment, cheap, cheerful, welcoming alterations and suggestions we can put to the city council to help them attract tourists into the place. And uh, you can mention um, parking charges in there if you want. But if any of, uh, of you have any thoughts or suggestions that we, you feel that these two groups should be looking at, then please don't hesitate. Feel free to send an email to me or David um, with your thoughts and suggestions. We'd love to hear from you. Right, that's enough from me. Um, you've met Sam uh, Riches before um, when she regaled you um, on uh, where uh, St. George pops up all over Europe and a few places beyond uh, into Asia. And um, as we're uh, approaching St. George's Day, we thought it's time that um, we had another look at um, St. George. So th the picture in front of you of Sam, um, the one in the glasses is Sam, uh, the one without the glasses is uh, St. George. Um, so <laughs> Welcome, Sam. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, if uh, you, I can see everybody's muted, so I'll now do the same. Thank God, everybody says. Um, over to you, Sam. Thank you so much, Sean, and hello. Good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to share my screen presently, but I just wanted to introduce you to, as John said, this is St George. It is a dragon dressed as St. George, but you'd only know this if you'd been in Belgium. Um, we will see evidence of the fact that St. George dresses like this with, with the gold helmet and the, the, yellow, um, the yellow jacket. We will see evidence of this shortly, but um, I just thought it would be, be useful to have um, a sense to start with of the extent to which St. George is recognised, but also is presented in ways which we may not recognize immediately. Um, so that's my starting point. I'm not gonna go over all the ground that I, I gave you a year ago, um, but I'm obviously very happy to take questions at the end because I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be some people who either don't remember or weren't there, haven't watched the recording. So there may be material that um, leaves you a little mystified, but hopefully we will get there between us. So. What I'm going to do then is to just um, cast St George briefly aside and I'm going to share my screen and we will start with what I hope is quite a familiar image and it will be um, the image that I actually left you with when I finished last time. Let's see if this is going to come up. There we are. So, um, by the way, is it being recorded? It is lovely. I didn't didn't see that coming up, but that's excellent. So here we are on St George's Quay, of course, in our own Lancaster. And the idea that I left you with is that when you see images of George and indeed the dragon, that there is a whole wealth of material and understandings that lie behind that and encouraging you to think in terms of that bigger picture. Uh, and we're gonna do a little bit more about that today and think about where else St. George may appear and in some of the um, guises that he may turn up. We're just gonna go up the road to start with, to Kendall. As I'm walking about, I take photographs of things that are St George related and um, I really like this one. So we've got a very clear image of the church with the sign in front of it. And I'm sure you'll notice that we've got a, um, a cross of St George, the red cross on, on a white field up in the top corner. But the thing that strikes me that won't necessarily strike you is the green background, not only the sign itself, but also the um, the grass and the bush and so forth. If the trees had been in leaf, that would be lovely. 
this is a topic that we will come back to. And it's something that I think St. George in this country, in England, um, it's difficult sometimes to notice the links between him and the natural world, the springtime. As we were waiting to start, there was a little bit of discussion of, of a tractor. And I thought, oh, that's very suitable for St. George. His name means a tiller of the earth, a farmer. Um, nothing at all to do with, with dragons. But it is a topic that comes up time and again in his cult in other parts of the world. And so I'd, I'd ask you to bear that in mind as, as one of our ideas that are perhaps not immediately apparent in our contemporary English understandings. We're still in Kendall. I was in the Museum of Lake and Life and very struck by this. So we have a fantastically important notice about a woolen cloth warehouse. Where is it? In a shop on the north side of St. George's Chapel. So where do we find St. George? We find him in dedications of churches and chapels. We've just had a church. Now we've got a reference to, to a chapel. And he also turns up in place names, as we're going to see presently, but sometimes in other ways, kind of encoded or presented from time to time. And it's always worth looking out for these things to see the possibilities of where George is occurring that may not be immediately obvious. still in the Museum of Lakeland Life. So description here of sports in Grasmere. And what do we have in the middle of the, uh, the piece in italics? Pace egging at Easter, when they perform the play of St. George and the Black Morocco Dog. Wonderful. This is a very Northwestern idea. Pace egging has got essentially two meanings. One is rolling eggs down a slope. Certainly something that you do at Easter time, most usually on Easter Monday, but also it is the name given in this part of the world to the mummers plays and it's because they're performed at Easter. So elsewhere, Christmas is the time for mumming, but actually I think Lancashire and Cumbria, the Northwest in general, have got it absolutely right. St. George is a saint of springtime. And calling the plays of St. George the Pace Eggers plays is absolutely appropriate to that. So it's not necessarily the case that you'll see a sign somewhere <laughs> that says in quite the way, way that this does. Here, as you can see, it's a quote from Lake District History by W.G. Collingwood. But it's those kinds of ideas that are that little bit hidden. You need to know where to look. Sometimes as here, they are, they are beautifully presented in museum displays. I have a whole bevy of people who send me photographs of things that they've taken. Oh, this will interest Sam. The answer is yes, I'm very interested in these kind of accidental discoveries. Uh, if you're wondering about the Black Morocco dog, there are various versions of the mumming play, the Pesegas play. The key thing is, though, that St. George does not kill a dragon. If you are finding a performance of the mummer's play where there is a dragon involved, it is a, a modern invention or even intrusion, I would say, because as far as we can be certain of the original form or perhaps safer to say, earlier forms of the mumming and, and pace egging tradition, St. George fights human enemies and he is usually killed and resurrected. So you have a figure of a doctor is very important and comes in. Various human adversaries that St. George has, um, the Black Prince of Paradine is one. And here the Black Morocco dog is a version of that idea. There's an, an oppositionality which 
on one level is perhaps about Christianity and what we could broadly call a, a heathen tradition. Um, sometimes it seems to invoke Islam, a topic we will come back to. But more often, I think it's really about good and bad, light and dark. It's a black Morocco dog, not a white Morocco dog. And that, that's, that's quite important. The idea of that oppositionality and one figure overcoming the other seems to relate to an idea of the spring banishing winter. We all know it's a temporary victory. Winter will inevitably reassert itself. And in this part of the world, does it rather sooner than you would wish. But the performance at this time of year, as the year turns, is really very, very appropriate as a way of marking that passage of the seasons. So there we have a nice little example of something that I just came across whilst I was busy doing something else. But sometimes I know that we're, I'm going to find St George. So we're here down in the West Country, um, a place name, lovely, Ogbourne St George. Of course, I go out of my way to take a photograph of it. My husband is wearily familiar with me saying, oh, look, we're not very far from here. Can we please go and get a photograph? So we were up in North Yorkshire, Darlington Borough Council, Middleton St George. I am gradually ticking them off. Maybe slightly less expected. If you have your wits about you in terms of dual language place name road signs, we're in Wales. We're in South Wales, not far from Cardiff. Oh, I hear you cry. Why do we have St George being invoked in Wales? Is it that dreadful English people have gone and absolutely insisted upon it? The answer is almost certainly no. Um, the Welsh, Sansiori, that is the local name of St George. A few years ago, I gave a talk uh, in Manchester at the cathedral and um, a lovely lady in her 80s came and spoke to me afterwards. And she's Welsh and she said to me, I'm so glad that you talked about St George in Wales because I can remember going out into the streets for St George's Day with, with branches of May and putting them down into the road and celebrating St George. And he was our saint. He was nothing to do with the English. I had a lovely idea of interviewing her and getting this all on record. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any response to my contacts with attempts to contact her. But that to me stands as a beautiful example of a very common idea that we will encounter again and again this evening, which is that St. George is local to wherever you happen to be at the time. So as English people, of course, we identify him as our patron saint. There were attempts to identify him actually as English. So we've got lovely traditions, for instance, that he was born in Coventry. He was born in Tintagel. Uh, various other things that, that, that link him very strongly into England. But if you go a distance away, none of that counts for anything at all. And St George is ours. He is where we are at the moment. So here he is definitely Welsh. And they prove it because just down the road is this absolutely wonderful wall painting of St George. You can hopefully just see the dragon's head down at the bottom left side. This is the reason why I was in that part of, of South Wales. Um, the wall painting got uncovered about six years ago, completely unexpectedly. Uh, there's a lovely little film on the BBC website if, if you want to look it up. Uh, and the person that was brought in as the kind of medievalist um, 
said, oh, you need to talk to Sam. So I then got contacted, saw some lovely photographs, said, yep, this is fine. I'm very, very happy with this being identified as St. George. Then when I was in Wales for a completely unrelated reason, I made a point of going and having looked at it for myself and hence found the road sign. Nobody had mentioned to me that just down the road was a village named after St. George. So it fits together absolutely beautifully. You might say, well, this shows a medieval interest in St. George, but does it show anything more than that? Is it that the idea of St. George as being Welsh or being localised to wherever you happen to be is something that is peculiar to that very strange time before the Reformation? Sam, is it just you're bringing your confirmation bias to the situation? You're looking for this and therefore you are finding it. Well, I'm not so sure. If we were all together, I'd be asking you where this is. And um, there's two answers to this. One is Italy, because it is the Italian chapel. It is deliberately Italianate in style. But the correct answer is Orkney. And I can assure you that when I went on holiday to Orkney, I had no expectation at all of coming up against anything St George related. Um, Orkney is arguably Scotland. It used to be Norway. Why on earth would there be anything to do with St George there? And when you visit the Italian chapel, there isn't much about St George until you go around the back. And there it is. There is a lovely sculpture of George and the dragon. And the key element about this is this was created before the chapel. The chapel is very, very famous in Orkney as a heritage site. It was built by Italian prisoners of war. But before they built the chapel, they put up this sculpture of St. George. They happened to have a, a, a sculptor in, in their ranks. Like this was how this was possible, able to be done. Here he is, looking a little battered, a um, bit rusty, but no question at all that this is an understanding of St. George. And it strikes me that perhaps the Orkney Tourist Board are coy about St George being there because they are bringing that assumption that we talked about earlier that St George means England. Whereas, of course, if you're Italian, St George means Italy. There are over a hundred settlements in Italy which are named after St George, directly invoke him in their the name of the settlement, just as we've seen with Ogburn St George and Middleton St George and St George Super Ely in Wales. So it's, there's, it's a really strong theme of, of locating him or invoking him in, in your place name. And I am absolutely convinced that when the Italian prisoners of war decided that what they really needed was a sculpture of St George, they were doing this with no understanding or no interest in any identification with England. Thankfully, there are some very nice information boards. So just as I've shown you from the Museum of Lakeland Life in Kendall, we're now outside the Italian chapel at Orkney and I photograph the information boards for you. The prisoners surround the statue of St George absolutely fantastic. You've got here the name of the artist, the sculptor at, at the top, and they are here indicating how important this sculpture that he created for them was. And then we're just going to move across to the, the second column and give you a bit more text. I think this is lovely. <clears throat> so I'm going to read this out to you. The statue of St George was built first. It shows the patron saint of soldiers ready to kill the dragon. That's why they were interested in him, because he is a military saint. But we go on. It is the symbol of a will to kill all misunderstandings among people of different cultures. 
as the St. George was built to express the physical and psychological pain, so was the chapel conceived to meet a spiritual need. I was so delighted when I found this wording. I thought that just sums it up beautifully, that St. George is here an incredibly positive figure. The dragon is, of, of course, a very negative figure, but what we have is St. George as symbolic of bringing people from different cultures together, as well as acting as a, a rallying point, literally a rallying point for soldiers. Physical and psychological pain being inherent in this image, I think is absolutely stunning. And again, it's something that, that does come up elsewhere. Most notably here, we're in Holland. We're in the town of Groningen, which is very near the German border. And um, this image demonstrates that I have not trained my son very well. He was at university in Groningen, and I went over to visit him. And I, in fact, I'd asked him if there was any reference to St. George anywhere. No, he said. Hadn't looked very hard, had he? Because the church here in the background, I went into on that, that initial visit and had a lovely time. That was great. Subsequently went back with my parents, wanted to show this church to my mother. It was shut. So we walked round the back and what did we find? This absolutely stunning war memorial. So we have St. George here, hardly a figure of victory. If anything, what he's doing is symbolising the futility of war and that idea of the psychological pain that we've just seen expressed at the Italian chapel. I love the way that the dragon is defeated. It's working around the plinth and you can probably just see the dates there. So it's a Second World War Memorial. The artist made a number of war memorials and he used St. George elsewhere too, but much more conventionally. So the kind of image that we're used to of St. George as a knight and overcoming the dragon very much in the way that we just had at the, uh, at the Orkney example. But I think this is such a beautiful rendering of a complex idea of war and particularly perhaps at the times that we're living through at the moment, the, um, the powerlessness of people to actually uh, work against something that seems to be completely overwhelming and is so negative, but really, really difficult for us to confront in a, in a meaningful way. So I was obviously somewhat annoyed with my son, but nevertheless really, really delighted to have found this piece with its fascinating discussion. So eloquent, I think, it's very, very moving piece. However, the idea of St. George as a soldier is very widespread. And we've got here a piece by the German artist, Hans Holbein. Um, I wanted to show you this not only because Holland, Kronigan being next to Germany, German artist, but also because of a number of really interesting points here. We're back into my comfort zone, into the, the late medieval period around, around the um, end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. Um, you'll notice St. George is not dressed as a medieval knight this time. Uh, it clearly wasn't in the Honigan image either, but what I think this is demonstrating is that there is a lot of flexibility. St. George can be a soldier in all sorts of different ways. Here he is shown as a Roman soldier. Um, I'm not sure they allow beards, to be honest. You don't often see a bearded St. George, but it does turn up now and again. Big talking point, though, is the white cross on a red field. So we very, very used to seeing the red cross on a white field. And in fact, I pointed it out to you in the sign outside the church at Kendall. But St. George doesn't have to have that symbolism. It's much more common than anything else, but you do get other things. And perhaps particularly where England has turned up in a rather 
um, colonial way, shall we say, St. George tends not to have the Red Cross and Whitefield because that's strongly associated with England. So those of you with long memories, I did talk about the subjects of my PhD research, which is an English alabaster altarpiece in Normandy. So this is when I spoke to you a year ago. And a point on that was that our English alabaster carvers and painters seem to be slightly at a loss to know what symbolism to give St. George on his shield. So they, they managed to minimize the device that was visible by turning the shield sideways on. Very, very clever. And St. George didn't wear a tabard or anything like this, which, which would need to have a device on it. Um, so it may be that if only they'd known what the other options were, um, they could have come up with something else. And nevertheless, it is definitely St. George because of the dragon. So just as here, um, it's got St. George written all over it, even though the device is not what we are used to. You can do all sorts of things with St. George. This is Trotsky, Leon Trotsky. So we are in Russia. You may be able to pick out the lettering on the dragon's tail. Absolutely wonderful. Reimaginings, reinventing. Um, St. George has been the patron saint of Russia. Obviously, it's um, uh, the position of religion there is, is, um, is somewhat complex um, since the Russian Revolution. But St. George is here of course, a figure of good and overcoming evil capitalism in the form of a dragon wearing a top hat. This is exactly the kind of, of idea that St. George as one of us really lends itself to and that oppositionality. So very different to the idea that we had at Groningen with the um, futility of war, but nevertheless equally powerful. Now, bringing us further up to date into the 21st century, I promised you St. George wearing a yellow jacket and the gold helmet, and here he is. So we are in Mon or Mons, depending how you like to pronounce it, the French way or the Flemish way. Uh, we're in Belgium. Now, this was the Queen's Jubilee weekend, uh, her 60th anniversary. Um, so everybody in England, it seems, was getting rained on and there was a big parade of boats on the River Thames. Meanwhile, I was in Belgium because every Trinity Sunday, there is a wonderful, huge festival, which includes St. George reenacting the fight with the dragon. Nothing at all to do with England. So you'll notice the red and white in the horse's mane. Um, but this is the city of Mons colours. I'm not sure that they're taken from St. George. I honestly don't think they are. It's the yellow coat. That's the thing which they strongly associate with George. So a little bit more research is needed to pin down why they use red and white. But um, it, is, it is definitely to do with the city. And they have this fantastic festival that goes all the way back to the Black Death. So middle of the 14th century, um, this plague, particularly virulent form of plague that swept across Europe, kills vast numbers of people. And the, the fine folk of Mon decided to try to keep the Black Death away by parading relics and calling on God to help them. It worked. So they've done it ever since. With very, very few pauses, um, for instance, during the Second World War, every year, they parade these relics around. It is absolutely stunning piece of um, theatre, essentially. It's a ritual recognised by UNESCO as um, of world importance, as in intangible culture. I'd never heard of it until shortly before I went. Um, and I would imagine most of us tonight haven't heard of it either. If anybody has heard of it, or even better been, then please do tell me when I finish speaking. Uh, why, why St. George? Why is he involved in this? Well, my rationale is 
that amongst the relics that get paraded is a relic of St George. And some clever spark in the 15th century realised, so, you know, wouldn't it have been going arguably for 100 years, realised that they could have quite a spectacle of reenacting the battle between George and the dragon. So this is what happens. Um, George helps out with the parading of the relics around the town. There's a particular bit where uh, the relics in a, in a carriage have to be taken up quite a steep ramp, a cobbled ramp, and it has to go up all, all in one go. If the horses pause, disaster will follow. So St George is at the back urging them on, and of course it works and everybody's very happy. Then they all rush off to the Grand Place to go and watch the battle. And here we are. So I couldn't get anywhere near the front. It was me and approximately a quarter of a million Belgian people, but they helpfully put up a big screen and we can see here George shooting the dragon with a gun. Um, it's one of the things that is so brilliant about the way that Mon has interpreted the legend of St. George is they are perfectly capable of changing him, his story, bringing in new ideas. So, for instance, at the beginning of the 21st century, it was thought that um, women should play a slightly stronger role. So there is now a woman who embodies the past of the city and another woman who embodies the future of the city. They both interact with St. George. They both assist him in terms of, of the battle with this, this dragon that's coming up. And the gun. I'm not sure at what point that was brought in, but... They do a bit of playing about with the lance and so forth, but it's the gun is the thing that actually um, sends the, the, the dragon on its way. It is a spectacle. There's no other word for it. Absolutely amazing. Trinity Sunday, in case you're, you're, you're wondering. Um, the festival goes on all week. It is, um, this is, the Trinity Sunday is kind of the high point. But one of the things that I really liked about it was they have a special day for the children to reenact the Battle of George and the Dragon because they're being trained. It's a huge honour to take part. And what you have is, of course, um, someone who's a tremendously good horseman, who's taking the part of St George, very well-trained horse as well. Um, and so it's, it's a constant idea that they're working towards who is going to be taking part next year and the year after and the year after. So you've, you've got to train the local children and make sure that they're all going to be ready to step in when it's their turn. I'm moving us further east now. We're actually coming right out of Europe. We're coming to Georgia. So this is Georgia in the Caucasus, uh, and we're in Tbilisi, the capital city of Georgia. I went there in, I think it was 2014, to go and witness St. George's Day in the winter. They like St. George so much that they have two St. George's Days a year, 23rd of April, same as us, and the 23rd of November. I thought I'd made a dreadful mistake when I arrived, although there was this very, very beautiful um, golden St. George and the Dragon, not far from where I was staying. Um, I pitched up at the tourist office, and uh, this was on the uh, 22nd of, of November, and said I'd come for St. George's Day, and they looked completely mystified. No idea. No, nothing we can recommend to you. Don't know, don't know what, what, um, what to tell you. So, as luck would have it, I was very nearby a chapel of St. George, and I went down there, and my goodness, it was all happening. Beautiful imagery of St. George, of course, throngs with people, there was blessings of bread, there was singing, there was parading around, it was, it was just fantastic. So I thought, oh, maybe I haven't made a horrendously expensive mistake after all. Um, of course, I was aware that it's an Orthodox um, country, so a particular strand of Christianity, and the eve of the feast day tends to be the big, the big center of, of attraction. So here I was on the evening of the 22nd, and I thought, well, I'll just wander down there on the 23rd and just, just see, who knows, there might be something happening. 
And oh yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, it was all going on. We had relics being paraded, the most beautiful singing I think I've ever heard, Georgian um, uh, Christian Christianity, their version of, of, uh, of the singing that they have is, is stunning. And even though we are in a capital city, we had a sheep. It was very, very reluctant, but it was coming to be blessed or correction. It was being brought to be blessed. Now, I didn't know much about what was likely to go on in Georgia on St. George's Day. But one thing I did know was that sheep would be playing a role. Um, I assumed this was something in a village and I really want to go back and experience St. George's Day out in the countryside. But here we are, capital city, sheep on a string. And even better, you bring your cockerel to church as well. Um, this very nice lady, uh, she, as you can see, is carrying her cockerel under her arm and she didn't take it into the church. I think that wasn't actually allowed. But what you are able to do is to is to carry the cockerel around and stop and get blessings upon it at various different points. Um, and I did talk to somebody else who who was who was fairly shy about being on camera, but nevertheless had good English. Was was happy to explain to me that it is about ensuring the fertility of the cockerel in come the spring. Because I did make a point of asking, was it destined for the pot? And she said, absolutely not. No, 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 this is the best cockerel that we have. And we are asking St. George's blessings upon it. So even though we are here in November, nevertheless, the ideas of the spring were very, very strong. And uh, the idea that I mentioned earlier on about invoking St. George, about fertility and about the um the the turn of the year and the the earth warming up and so forth it's still detectable here and come the day when i do make it to um to georgia for the springtime st george's day i think i'm gonna have all of this and more And this is one of the reasons. Now, you can't tell from this picture that this is St. George's Day being celebrated, but nevertheless, it is. Um, it is a group of Roma people, and their version of St. George's Day is called Adlaitsi. It's a very important festival, 6th of May, which is old St. George's Day. You'll be aware, of course, of the, the change from the... Um, uh, Gregorian and Julian calendars where, where things that we lost, we lost all these days and so forth. So um, in some Orthodox traditions, and in particular, the form of Christianity that's followed by Roma people, they, they mark the 6th of May as being St. George's Day. And it is absolutely about the springtime. So there's been some fascinating work done in terms of Serbian tradition and Bulgarian tradition still to this day also in, in uh, amongst Roma communities um, invoking St George's blessings and protection casting um, figures of St George made out of willow casting into water lots of ideas that are taken from outside of Christianity arguably they've been they've been Christianized there's also some wonderful oral history um, from Estonia, so from the far north, where people have been recorded talking about what you do on St. George's Day. It's when you turn the cattle out, you bless them, you beat them with catkins to keep them healthy. The, um, the priest will come and pass a figure of St. George over and around the animals and also the children, the herd children that look after the animals. Really, really strong tradition. And I think that if we were to get a, um, a time machine and be able to go back to the 15th century around here, I think some of that would be going on. So our Paceggers that I talked about earlier, do you remember with the, the battle between the human characters and the triumph of light over dark and spring over winter and so forth? I'm not going to claim to you that there's some kind of unbroken tradition back to the medieval period. I'm really not saying that because the evidence isn't there, but we've got some kind of persistence, I think. If not, it's a massive coincidence. And I believe in coincidence, but not that much. 
Now, I promised you some Islam. In uh, the Sufi tradition in particular, the folkloric figure of al Qudr, which means the green one, hurrah, the color green, is identified with a figure that we would recognize as St. George. Now, I'm not expecting you to pick St. George out here, but what I'm showing you is an element of the story of al Qudr where a salted fish is brought back to life. And it is the influence of al Qudr that makes this happen. He apparently has found a, um, a well of immortality and he bathes in it and leaves green footprints wherever he goes, strongly associated with the coming of spring, also ending of drought, those sorts of ideas. There is some evidence, um, particularly in Palestine, that the uh, Muslim community there recognize figures of George and the Dragon as al Qudr. But I think there is, it's difficult to find the direct uh, parallel in the traditions of al Qudr as far as I understand. Um, I've got another image of al Qudr for you, which I think is, makes the point really well. So al Qudr, the green one, as we can see here, he's got his fish, but he's also a traveler, a wanderer. Um, he is not leaving green footprints, but He's certainly dressed in green and, and the positioning of him. Um, this is a modern piece of art where they, they brought together the trees in a photograph and um, a manuscript, a late medieval manuscript illumination of al Qudr brought those together. It's um, very much the idea of the natural world. Uh, so I think that, Again, if England didn't have any of this stuff, it would really be extremely unusual. Why would you remove ideas of even the dragon as, as wintertime, as the earth that has to be tamed as wilderness? Those sorts of ideas we can find. Um, St. George is a farmer, as I said right at the beginning. That is the meaning of his name. St. George gets co-opted into all sorts of things. I'm here back in Tbilisi, and as far as I can work out, this is um, an insignia of St. George that's used on an insurance company. Um, he is pretty much everywhere you look. Uh, I, I did a deeply unscientific survey of icon shops, and St. George is second only to Images of Christ as, uh, and the Virgin Mary particularly together. But yes, I did buy an icon of St. George. But let us not stay only in Georgia. They are one of two countries that claim to have the longest unbroken tradition of Christianity, their own version, Georgian Christianity. The other country that has a similar claim is Ethiopia. And here we are a bottle of St. George beer from the St. George Brewery. I have had some beer from the St. George Brewery and fine thing it is. You'll notice there's some lettering here in a doubtless to most people unfamiliar script. And this is Amharic. And it tells us that it is the everyday choice. Now, we might think, oh, that sounds a bit ordinary. It's saying that, um, you know, it's not for special occasions. It's just every day and it's a bit, you know, it's nothing special. Actually, the meaning seems to be that St. George and St. George beer are indispensable. They're so important that you look to them and particularly St. George, you rely upon him every day. There's an equivalent in Lebanon. The Lebanese Christians have a wonderful saying, which is, God is great, but he's not like St. George, because St. George is who you turn to in every eventuality. If you're unwell, if you need some, somebody to be found, if you need um, help with the debt, St. George is always your first port of call. In fact, there's even an understanding that sometimes St. George may, might get tired because of all of the demands that are made upon him. And 
In common with some of the other places we've been talking about, if not all of them, St George is localised. He is one of us. Here he is in his lovely Ethiopian guise. Um, if you have got really sharp eyes, you might even be able to see that he's got his feet so that the stirrup is coming through between his toes, a bit like wearing um, a flip-flop, same kind of idea. That is a deeply symbolic presentation to do with the power of St. George as a leader. Um, Black St. George is a strong, strong tradition. And it's something that, again, I think is often overlooked or misunderstood in countries that only know their own understandings. We're briefly going all the way to Brazil. Tremendously important figure. Um, again, it's on my list, I've not been yet, but uh, Rio de Janeiro, Saint Sebastian is their official patron. Saint St. George is the unofficial patron. Slightly disappointed that this is very clearly a white St. George, but nevertheless, the way that he's being paraded absolutely fits with the understanding I have of how popular he is. The chances are that he has come to them from Portugal, which is where we are now. This is uh, Lisbon, and we're at the castle of St. George with this rather jolly bearded St. George, you'll notice. Um, Red cross and a white field? I don't think so. Absolutely no need to think there's anything to do with that here, other than arguably the colour of the flowers. That's the only thing that I, I, would, I would pick out. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we popped across to Lisbon now and there were completely different flowers on display. I, I don't think there's anything to say that this is how um, the colour scheme has to work. Um, Again, a bit like Germany, St. George has been recognised as the patron saint of Portugal. And I was taken by this sign just down from St. George's Castle. Um, it is the, um, the drugstore, the castle drugstore. Lovely little um, cartoons on it. And top right, I have a little detail for you. There is George and the rather cute dragon. Um, Red Cross and a white field, no, not at all, but definitely St. George. Uh, lots of references to him around there. I have now for you um, a dairy, a St. George dairy. Uh, really nice um, little, little place to go and get a milkshake or what have you. No reason at all for it to be called St. George, other than obviously Portugal's interest in George, the fact that he's right next door to St George's Castle. But I just float to you the possibility that he may have an association with dairying. This is definitely true in Italy. He is a patron saint that you look to to protect your milk supply and to enable you to churn the butter successfully. Um, there is, again, if you know where to look and, and put the pieces together, it's possible to, to come up with what I hope is um, a reasonably persuasive understanding of, of these ideas being quite widespread and quite deep. Briefly back to Ethiopia, though, just reminding you of our nice black St. George. We're back in England now. We're down the road in Manchester and we are in Manchester Cathedral. So I'm showing you here uh, the Fraser Chapel in Manchester Cathedral, which had this artwork, this, um, essentially it's a, it's a triptych, but it's all on one panel, but it's three different elements to it. Um, I've got a, a close up for you now, uh, but it was created for um, the turn of the millennium. And unusually as a medievalist, I have had the opportunity to talk to the artist. Uh, it's a wonderful thing because you can have all kinds of ideas about artworks and then you talk to the artist and find that you've actually got it all wrong and it's not what they meant at all. So when I spoke with Mark Cazalet and I said to him, um, St. George is black in this image. Uh, is that because of the Ethiopian tradition? And he said, no, I was totally unaware of it. 
I just happen to have a portrait that I've done of a reggae artist um, called Lee Scratch Perry. And I thought, oh, that would work quite well. So he had, was choosing to subvert the traditional English idea of George and the Dragon. Um, because the main thing that St. George is doing is freeing the dragon. The dragon is shackled and St. George has got bolt cutters and is taking them to free the dragon. It's The idea is that it's symbolising the potential of Manchester. Um, and St. George is helping to bring Manchester back to vitality. In case you're wondering about the rest of the image, it is very, very Mancunian. Um, we have what probably is um, God the Father, God the Son, and the Virgin Mary eating chips. And then the chap on the right holding his, his head in his hands is St. Denis, Saint Denis, who is the, the other patron of. Manchester Cathedral and um, there's a whole piece there about walking through a shopping centre and uh, commercialism and good or bad that sort of thing but focusing in on on St George um, this has by no means been an unproblematic image I was asked to go down to Manchester and give a talk um, which was essentially I was asked to explain is it okay for St George to be presented as black and take an hour to do it. And I did, and I was extremely happy to talk about that tradition. And this is uh, in, in Ethiopia. This is well before I, I had spoken with the artist. Um, but when it was unveiled, a piece was run in the Manchester Evening News, uh, which was very positive, very nice. But unfortunately, some um, people, let us say, of a somewhat right-wing tendency, uh, took huge exception to this work of art and um, the British National Party organized a kind of um, campaign of death threats and so forth. Um, I'm not gonna say it was necessarily members of the British National Party that, that made those death threats, but nevertheless, it is what happened. Uh, and it was really an extremely problematic situation all round. And then, um, the image was actually attacked. It was physically attacked with a knife. Um, and I then speaking later to, to Mark, the artist, he said he thought actually it was an interesting comment on the power of St. George uh, to, to withstand negative readings as um, and he actually was, was quite happy to leave the um, to leave the, the, the scar, as it were, there. In fact, it was repaired. Um, but I think it's important to, to, for us to bear in mind that not understanding the broader context, not understanding that St. George is recognised in different cultures, is recognised outside of Christianity as well as within Christianity, can have really, really problematic consequences. So I've just given you a quite difficult example there of um, essentially racism and xenophobia, fear of the other. But I can give you the, the counter situation, which is I was involved um, in putting together a website about St. George for use in schools in Cumbria. And um, when it was first launched, um, a parent got in touch, emailed us, absolutely furious, how dare you? How dare you bring this xenophobic, racist figure to, to my child's school and we very politely emailed back and said, um, have you actually read the website? Have you seen, seen what's on there? Um, and then to be, uh, to be fair to this parent, they came back and said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I now see what you're doing. Yes, thank you. St. George does work for that. Because we had a piece on there about St. George in Islam. We had a piece about St. George in Romani culture. We had um, understandings of St. George around the world. and this idea that I pointed you to with the Orkney example of St. George being able to um, relieve or address misunderstandings between different cultures. So too often in my experience, a snap um, understanding is reached. People think, I understand what this is about and I don't like it, either because they are bringing their perception of St. George as, as simply being a figure of empire, 
or because they say St George's is, is white and English and anything else is, is bad and wrong. So it's not uncomplicated, but hopefully you're getting some sense of the richness. So how the good St Knight of, sorry, the good Knight St George of England slew the dragon and set the princess free. Here he is covered in little white crosses, red crosses on a white field. Um, it's actually set in the garter, the, the symbol of the Order of the Garter. So it's this kind of weird anachronism where St. George is shown in relation to something that was set up because he was the patron. It's really odd. It's sort of, if St. George was real, that's a very big if, but if he was, he's early fourth century. The Order of the Garter is set up in the 14th century, so a whole thousand years apart. Um, and then this image here is created in the workshop of uh, the William Morris Company. So pre-Raphaelites, Dante Gabriel Rossetti seems to be involved in the design. Oh, my goodness, where to start with this? I mean, it's a beautiful thing, but wow, has it got some big mistakes in terms of, of the medieval understanding and let alone the fact of the international understandings as I've hopefully been demonstrating to you. So, um, yeah, that is a very, very particular understanding, St. George of England. And I think that it has been more uh, tenacious than really it ought to be. And I hope I'm doing my small bit to, to try to break down the stereotypes that that image plays into and has um, has entrenched. Just one example here of quite how badly the pre-Raphaelites misunderstood uh, medieval understandings of St George. How great rejoicing was made for the wedding of St George and the princess. Um, no, St George never got married according to medieval understandings. Um, he's offered the princess his hand. That happens sometimes in medieval versions of the story. She's said to be arrayed as a bride, which means she's wearing her best clothes because um, the idea of the white wedding dress is a Victorian invention. Um, so the pre-Raphaelites like to think that the medieval was wonderful and that they were, were bringing it into what for them was the modern era. Um, the reality was they were completely distorting it according to, to their own ends. And it's actually fitting into a Victorian model. But again, the idea of St. George as being English is something that is underlining these um, the, the, uh, the post-Reformation ideas that the pre-Raphaelites are using. Um, I won't say more about that for now, but I'm happy to, to say a bit more if people would like when I've finished, because we're countering towards the end. Um, if I can, oh, I've just managed to hit the wrong button. There we go, that one. That's the one I want. Yeah, so a little bit about this, to me, somewhat difficult periods in, in um, the cult of St. George. So empire, ideas of empire, my, my correspondent, you know, how dare you bring this awful xenophobic racist figure into my child's school? It's because of ideas that were picked up and were perpetuated um, around the um, England, Britain as, as, as being colonial and for our young people, scouts here, to be um, inculcated into that way. So it didn't at all seem to have the understanding of St George as an international figure. So this is from quite an early book uh, about, about scouting. I've got another example here for you. So it isn't specifically saying this is St. George, but it's young knights of the empire. You've got the um, allusion to St. George in, in the banner there. And um, some quite nice ideas, um, you know, do a good turn to somebody every day, written on bars. Um, going across, though, courtesy, kindness, obedience, cheerfulness, thrift, purity um there are there's there's quite a lot of um ideas that are inherent with saint george to do with chastity so actually fits quite well with the idea of purity and indeed honor on the far left um so you can see why 
uh, Baden Powell was interested in St George and wanted to use him, but I wish that he had seen him as an international figure rather than something that was really English, because ultimately I don't think it has worked to the favour of um, of, of St George and people's uh, understanding of him as our patron. It's not all down to the scouts, though. This is an image from an incredibly popular play, completely forgotten about now, pretty much. It's called um, Where the Rainbow Ends, and it is a story that was presented at Christmas time on stage Essentially, it was um, a rival to Peter Pan in its popularity. It was put on year after year after year in the West End theatres. Um, it was also made into a novel. And there is St George at the front, the, the prow of the ship. Um, this is towards the end of the play when every, you know, everyone's rescued and going home. And, and uh, we have Cubby behind him, this character of the, the British, British lion cub who's... Um, uh, plays an important role in the in the story. Um, our naval cadets, who are the heroes, there's their sisters. They they go and rescue parents. Um, there's some some nice elements. I, I particularly like the bit where um, they meet the slacker, who um, is um, lounging around watching the gnomes play cricket, uh, which apparently is a very bad thing to do. So it's got some some moments of humour. But there's also racism and anti-Semitism and all sorts of really quite prob problematic things. And above all, the idea of St. George being English and um, he's been, you know, he's sort of been, been overlooked and, and he's a hero who has to be, be, um, be brought back and, and revivified. And it's, it's to uh, settle, settle the hash of the, of the other less worthy nations. That, that's very much the idea that's invoked there. And when we see things like this, this is a pub in London where I was in 20, um, 2018. Uh, yeah, and I think those ideas are underlying when we get the free bangers complete with Green Grocer's apostrophe, uh, bangers and mash. It's, it's not a negative idea in itself, but it's, I think, a very limited, very, very limited understanding of St. George. And what was interesting for me is I saw that board outside a pub um, as I made my way here. So this is in Southwark and it is, um, Southwark is a, is a fascinating place, which is absolutely imbued with St. George and indeed dragons. And we're at a, um, an unofficial uh, unconsecrated graveyard called Crossbones. Um, which is is now really deeply recognised in Southwark as being somewhere that the um, the prostitutes um, who were employed in the brothels run by the church over the river uh, they they ended up in unconsecrated grounds here so um, they're known as the stews if you wish to to look them up at all uh, but the Crossbones graveyard is really um, a very fascinating place and every year there is a big um, tradition of George and the dragon there and the reason for that is largely due to this man who is John Constable who is a playwright and um, he wrote the Southwark Mysteries which were performed in Southwark Cathedral for the year 2000 and featured St George riding a motorbike absolutely amazing I didn't know John at that stage um, but we've we've corresponded a great deal. In fact, I'm going to go and be with him for an event in Glastonbury this St George's Day, which will be terrific. Um, but one of the things that jo that John um, had had thought about St George was that he was overburdened and too many people were asking things of him, and he got tired. It's exactly the same idea that you get in Lebanon. And John was so happy when I told him, and I was so happy that John had had this this idea. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, it was picked up in that play of, um, of uh, Where the Rainbow Ends. And it's, I think, just um, John has taken it in a different direction. And he sees St. George very much as being part of um, uh, a culture of revival, bringing people together. I mean, look at this. St. George and the dragon are holding hands. They're making friends. It's just fabulous. So lovely to see. 
This particular event, we had people from all different parts of the world taking part. There were Portuguese people who were reading out their um, poetry, uh, invoking St. George. Um, and other times when I've been there, there's been Ethiopian people organising a picnic, because that's what you do on St. George's Day in Ethiopia. It's just fantastic, the range and versatility and St. George being understood as being so positive and having something to say to so many different people. Um, I took this image just as we were going into the, into the graveyard to process around. And I thought it was very, very powerful. You've got candles there. You've got obviously ribbons. People are tying things onto the, the gates, invocations, little prayers. This isn't something you see in England. It really isn't. You find it elsewhere in the world and you find it also outside Christianity. So I know one or two places a bit off the beaten track um, outside of Christianity in this country where you can find things like bags being hung in trees and, and so forth and gifts being left. It's never, never quite clear what the deity is that they're, they're going to. And here I think it's partly to do with St George, it's partly to do with um, a, a, greater, a greater sense of um, goodness and positivity and fertility and so forth. Um, but it's speaking, I think, to a very deep need that some of our people have um, in Southwark and this Crossbones graveyard um, is, is a place of a resort for them. And St George is very much part of that. So. There you go. Sainsbury's, 2014. Happy St. George's Day. Um, hmm. I took this roundel from Lancaster, Sainsbury's. <laughs> no dragon, interestingly. English, yeah, arguably. Love the beard. Really nice. Unusual to see St. George with a beard in this country. Um, possibly a medieval knight. Hard to be completely certain. but. I leave you with this thought that when you do see St. George and invocations of St. George's Day, my goodness, there's a lot going on that isn't immediately apparent. And I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Oh, I'm in darkness. Let me just put the light on. Uh, that's a relief. I thought it was my screen. Um... <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, a lot to think about, certainly. Um, has anyone uh, got any questions? I'll bring some you're, you're all back muted. You, you can now open up your um, microphones and speak. Um, so George has returned um, to the screen. Uh, I did have one question. Uh, right at the very beginning, you showed that uh, wall paintings have been mm. uncovered recently and I noticed that that was a red cross on a white background was that in a Welsh church yes it is yeah yeah it's called uh, Clan Farken um, so, if you so want to look it was, up so there's the Welsh actually showing the English yeah cross. yeah I don't think they saw it as English though I think it's a bit it's kind of malleable um and also it depends who did the painting, because I think with the alabaster cross people that I talked about last time, and I did a, a brief reference to them tonight, I think that if all you're used to is giving St. George a red cross on a white field, what are you gonna do instead? Um, so I think that it's not impossible it was an English artist, but what, what we can be pretty confident is that it was Welsh people paying for it. Um, so right. I think there that the fact it's a red cross on a white field doesn't imply that they thought that St. George was English or, or were identifying him in relation to England. They thought he was they thought he was Welsh or they thought he was possibly a universal saint and they happened to want to have an image of him. So we've, I think there are six different wall paintings of St. George, medieval ones in Wales. And that's the best preserved by, by, by some considerable margin. There's also a healing well of St. George in Denbyshire, um, which is very good for horses. Uh, it's so powerful that just one horse from a stable needs to drink that water and then all of the horses in the stable are protected. 
No, I thought you were going to say you dip them. Um, no, no, you don't need to dip them. No, no, you just, I too have drunk from that well of St. George. Right. Uh, um, uh, San, San Sion, as, uh, as they would call him there. And, uh, and I've never had any horse diseases since then, so it obviously works. Good, good. Uh, any, uh, anyone else like to uh, put two penneth in? No. Um, right. Well, it, it just remains me in that case to, uh, oh, to uh, uh, oh. somebody waiting. Dave, Dave is trying to say something. I think he was muted. Yeah, well, go on, David. You, you mute. Both Davids are muted. So um, yeah, there you that's are. better. Right. Fire away. I'm mute. Now, no, you get on oh, with yeah, it now. Okay. You can hear me. Yes. Have you ever been to um, uh, Sam, uh, play a little unremarkable village in the middle of Italy, not far from Naples, called Soriano Nel Simino? I haven't, no. <laughs> well, I, I've got some things uh, from there which might be of interest to you. Excellent. They, uh, they, they have um, a remarkable event every year called the Chestnut Festival. Mm -hmm. where they, they, have, they have thousands of chestnut trees around the village uh, and they, they cook these things in the middle of the town. The population is probably, I'm guessing, around about 4,000 or maybe a bit more. But during this festival, they have a most extraordinary pageant. <coughs> and it's not a touristical thing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really for and by the people who live there. And of this population of about 4,000, there are something like 2,000 participating. Uh, and they're all dressed up in quite remarkable um, representations of the sort of thing that people would wear um, in the, around about 1500 or a bit earlier. And also that the things that they did, agricultural implements, um, hobbies, um, hunting with falcons, live falcons being taken through the streets. And of course, a tremendous figure of St. George on his horse and an extremely large and very terrifying looking dragon. Wonderful. Which, which and I've not, I have, uh, or we have between us, Kathleen and I, I don't know how many photographs we took of this. I would imagine we probably have about 80, but I could send you a choice selection. Oh, please. I'd be absolutely delighted. We'll yes. You'll, you'll have to send me an email um, to, yeah. I can send it back. To you. David's got my email address, the other David. So, can, yeah. Um, but okay. yeah, you're, you're welcome to pass that on. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. No, that's great. I think that you're absolutely right. There's, there's, I think. If, if you know where to look, you can find these, these kinds of um, pageants and festivals and so forth. But, you know, if somebody was to try and, and list them all, it would be very, very difficult because it's they're so often done by the local people for the local people. As you yeah. say, it's not something that's that's promoted as, as being um, a tourist event. And remember I said about when I arrived in T Tbilisi, I thought I made this horrendously expensive mistake. and There wasn't going to be anything, according to the tourist office. And it seems the reality was that. It's a bit like someone shipping up here in Lancaster and going to the Visitor Information Centre on, say, the 23rd of December and saying, I've come for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Where would we send them? What would we tell them to look at? It's so part of the fabric of our life that we don't think about it, the, mm. the things that people do to, to mark Christmas. And for St George's Day, it's like that only more so. Um, so I think that, that there are so many of these kind of slightly, they're not hidden in the sense of, of someone's deliberately trying to suppress them or, or not letting outsiders know. It's just that they are, they, they're just ordinary as people see it. So like, like with the beer bottle, you know, the everyday choice, it's something that is St. George's has woven into, into the fabric of people's lives. Uh, right. And, um, David, when you send those pictures to David, can you make sure you spell the name of the village? Uh, oh, yes. Then, um, <laughs> then Sam knows where to book. Um, Absolutely, I'll put it on my list. Certainly, <laughs> Naples. Uh, right. Uh, anything else? No. Well, um, 
Can I remind Jill that she now needs to go and thrash her cattle with catkins? Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> and uh, again, thank you, Sam. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, good night. Can I just um, can yeah. I just say as well before before you all go? Um, next month uh, we've got a change from what was planned. And we've now got a new chief executive for Lancaster City Council, Mark Davis. Uh, he only took office uh, the 1st of April. And um, he's coming to give us a, a talk next month, uh, you know, well, a chat generally about uh, his vision for, for Lancaster. Uh, so uh, I think we, a bit of a coup to get him this early on in his, uh, yeah, before before he's um, got his feet under the desk properly, I think. So that, that next month, it, it's slightly later next month. It is the uh, 16th. Uh, I think it's the 16th, 16th or 18th, 16th. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll send the date through, but it is quite a coup. He, he uh, Mark actually sought us out um, to ask if he yeah. could speak to us. So... Oh. Um, I think that's a, a bit of kudos for the society um, yeah. that we are being noticed by the right people. Can, um, we, can we also say a big, you know, a, a, a one of our typical thank yous to Sam. It's been a, a lovely, I've thoroughly enjoyed the talk. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I hadn't realised, I mean, I, we learned a lot last year, but how far and wide he goes, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, really. The Orkney, I've been there. Uh, that's the wonderful, magical place that is. Um, Ogborn St George, I used to live by there many years ago and never never realised the, the connection. But it's been fantastic. Can everybody just give that Sam, you know, one of our, you know, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Lovely to see you all. And, um, yeah, if you can say to Mark, if he'd like to do a St George Festival in Lancaster, I think uh, we know, be, we know, we, we, we know, you know we, we've, we've got the place names. We can we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> it will fit with your idea about encouraging tourism as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As, long as long as I can be a paid consultant and get get a trip to uh, Italy now, obviously, and I want to go back to <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the sound just went just before the word consultant, but um, <laughs> you're. Uh, <laughs> uh, these people touting for money. Uh, Absolutely. Go on, go on. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks all. Can I just, Thank can you. Good night. Can, can I just say one little thing? Yeah, yeah. It's, far away um, it's a great talk. It's more to do with what uh, you said right at the very beginning concerning tourism in Lancaster. I'm really heartened to hear that you're really looking to see out of a moat because I think the local council are really quite pathetic that we've got such a brilliant city like Lancaster and even aspects of Morecambe and the surrounding area and there's far more could be done to promote it into, into a much more interesting historic centre. I always think it's so sad that so much of it, so many people know nothing about at all. You're quite right. Um, I'm f I totally agree with you. Um, this is something we are passionate about. Uh, you know, that's why we're the Civic Society. We, we love this place and we want other people to come and find out why we love it so much. So, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. we'll, we will, um, we're working hard on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, right. You can go home now. Put the kettle on. <laughs>